So we have a few people coming in, and I'll just go through the the usual spiel of, you know, Belmont Books is an independent bookstore located in Belmont, Massachusetts, which is outside Cambridge. So if you're you're joining us from other places in the world, feel free to let us know. We're happy to have you. It's also nice that, you know, most of us are spending our work lives and school lives on Zoom and computers. So we really appreciate you getting back on your computer for something that's social and fun and book related. So very appreciated. In terms of events, we have a pretty robust events calendar in the coming months. Um, next week, we don't have anything scheduled in Belmont. I believe it's like uh, vacation week in February. So we are taking that week off. But the last week of February, we have um, an event Tuesday night with Susan Conley in conversation with Marianne O'Hara. And then Wednesday night at seven, we have Nancy Johnson in conversation with Jenna Blum. And uh, Nancy Johnson's book, The Kindest Lie, is currently a staff pick. So we're very excited about that event. And then Thursday at 6.30, we're kicking off our new monthly bedtime story time series. So each month we will have a group of children's book authors kind of read bedtime stories on Zoom. So we hope that you will join us for one of those, all of those, some of those. Um, and then I'm going to introduce our two poets tonight. They will talk, probably do a reading or two. And then at about 7.45, quarter till, I will come back on to help facilitate questions and discussion. So if you have any questions for Maxim or Tatiana, you can put them in the Q&A portion at the bottom. So if you see there's like two little speech bubbles and it says Q&A, you can submit your questions there. Um, if you forget, don't worry, I will be monitoring the chat so I can field questions through there as well. Um, totally your choice. Um, but let's introduce these two poets. So Max and Dee Schreyer, a translingual author, scholar, and translator, is a professor of Russian, English, and Jewish studies at Boston College. We've done, I believe, in previous events with Maxim, so it's always nice to have him back. Born in Moscow in 1967 to a writer's family, Schreyer immigrated to the United States in 1987. He has authored over 15 books in English and Russian, among them the internationally acclaimed memoir, Leaving Russia, A Jewish Story, the collection Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, and the anthology Voices of Jewish-Russian Literature. His works have been translated into nine languages. Schreyer won a 2007 National Jewish Book Award, and in 2012, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Schreyer's recent books include A Russian Immigrant, Three Novellas in English, and Anti-Semitism and the Decline of Russian Village Prose in Russian. Now on to Tatiana Rebecca Schreyer. When I read Tatiana's bio, it was just one line of, is a seventh grader at the Driscoll School in Brookline, but I feel like that doesn't do a poet who supplied this collection justice to just call her a seventh grader. Um, her poems won second place in Stone Soup Magazine's 2019 book contest. And Schreyer's Searching for Bow and Arrows is about the weight of histories, one's own personal familial history, as well as the history of politics and nations, and a nostalgic longing for a homeland that both is, is, is and isn't home. Um, I'm excited to have both of these poets on the same screen, which I think is a first for our, for our virtual events, is to have two people in the same room. Um, so I will turn it over to Maxim and Tatiana, and I will be back in about 45 minutes. Good evening. We're thrilled to be here, Tatiana and I. We are thrilled to speak virtually at Belmont Books, which is a wonderful bookstore with many connections to the community. Its founder, Kathy Crowley, is an amazing person, a writer and a doctor. And we're really grateful to the bookstore, to Amanda for hosting, and also, of course, to all of you 
for being here. Tatiana and I are launching our two new books. Uh, Tatiana will read first uh, and I will read second. I just want to preface this uh, by saying that it's a special night. It's uh, the eve of the Chinese New Year and uh, we for various reasons, uh, have uh, many friends and colleagues who are from China or who work in uh, the area of uh, China, Chinese studies. And uh, we just want to welcome you as well. Tatiana has been studying Mandarin and she's gonna say a special welcome. That's great. And I also just wanna say that Tatiana and I would like to dedicate this reading to my father, Tatiana's grandfather, David Schreier Petrov, who is uh, my mentor in poetry and who has been Tatiana's. Uh, very recently, he turned 85, and uh, this is a very happy occasion for both of us. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to my poetry mate, to my younger daughter, Tatiana, who will read from her new book. I'm going to read some poems. The first poem I'll read is called First Tornado. On Cape Cod, a leaden day descended over the bay. Lights were flickering in the church. The wind ripped through the birch. The rain tore through the cloud. Thunder and lightning came around. Then it stopped and all was dark. Thousands of trees were down. The steeple was lying on the ground like an open battle wound. Much Mother Nature said its word, first tornado on Cape Cod. I'm now going to read Hope. Hope is a friend, or maybe a foe. It carries me across the treacherous ice and the darkening sky. It watches me with glistening eyes, knowing me better than I. I'm going to now read The Jewish Graveyard. I made a journey from Boston to St. Petersburg to visit my forebears at a Jewish graveyard. On the way, we stopped at a little bake shop with tired women selling baled bread. My father and I entered a rickety gate in front of the old synagogue. A stooped man with a wheelbarrow asked if we needed water to wash the graves. Wash the graves once a year, I wondered? To connect with the ancestors I'd never met? To speak to them? To hear their wisdom? to keep the memory awake. On the way back, we crossed a long gray bridge over railroad tracks and abandoned factories. I was thinking, would Russia be in my dreams if my father hadn't left forever? I'm now gonna read a poem called Memories Caught in Seaweed. Wet feet on the sand, touching the seaweed. Memories dissolve in the tide. People toss wet seaweed as if it's a joke to lose one's memories. Yet, when the seaweed dries in the sand, it forms a grid and returns to life, our memory restored. I'm gonna read The Ghost of Fyodor Dostoevsky. Walking upstairs where Dostoevsky walked before, looking through doors where he looked before, sitting in chairs where he sat before, mourning his son, young son, Alexei, Ringing doorbells Dostoevsky ran before, looking at pages he wrote before, shadows of him filling the air as a white night falls on the Baltic shore. I'm gonna read now, old tech tennis rackets on the wall. My relatives once played with these old tennis rackets. Their souls bounce on the strings like scraps of forgotten music while their hands grip new handles on a star paved tennis court. I'm now gonna read a collection of poems, three poems about Chile. This is, these are the first poems I ever wrote. Santiago. Santiago in the afternoon, the Andes built with rocks and moon. Oh, I wonder if I glide, I'm coming home soon. Last night of the world. Last night of the world, New Year's Eve in the mountains of Pucon, a local girl and a local boy slaughtering a lamb. The tourists will eat for New Year's supper as the volcano erupts with beer. 
Vina Del Mar. Today, I went to the beach in the Pacific, dead jellyfish on the sand, then took a bus to the hotel. Out the window, I saw rusty cars, tired people in corner stores, buildings with graffiti and peeling paint. It was a living city. I'm now gonna read Train Tracks at Sobibor. On a spring morning, we arrived from Lublin to witness what was left of the death camp. A rusty peeling sign came into view. It screamed Sobibor. The Nazis destroyed evidence of the gas chambers. What was left were the grounds through which Jewish bodies walked to take the shower of death. As I, as I stood on the platform and touched the tracks, I felt like a little girl named Hannah looking for her murdered parents. Now I'm gonna read Moping Along Muddy River. On a cold winter morning, I have a class at the Museum of Fine Arts. The frosty wind awakens me. I turn to the river in there, like a still life created overnight. Muddy ice shaped like dirty brushes, a mallard crossing to the other side, a plastic bottle floating in the water hole. As I run up the granite steps, I know what to paint today. And the last poem I'll read is called The Graduates. I was 10, I stayed on the Upper West Side, an old hotel with dusty paintings and gilded frames. My father kept telling me not to lose anything and not to be at my smartphone all the time. I was on the third floor, not too far from the ground, a view of a bird's nest and dark alleyways, cluttered with trash cans and filled with loud music for the graduates. As the day unfolded, aging parents woke up and came down to take their coffee at the French bistro Nice Matin, where croissants were warm and omelets runny. As I watched these parents at breakfast, I thought they looked both anxious and glad, and I wondered if they too felt like graduates starting a new adventure. Soon these graduates will dissolve into a big new world, a hidden one beneath the water's edge that I have yet to see, have yet to love. Thank you. I particularly, particularly admire this last poem, in part because it comes from a time not uh, not so from not not just such a distant past, but a time that was so different. Because uh, one could visit Manhattan, stay in hotels, and go to museums. Now it almost seems like something unattainable. In any case, uh, I do hope that Tatiana will read some more after I have uh, read a few poems. Uh, just very briefly, I want to tell you how this uh, collection came about. So these poems uh, of politics and pandemics, songs of a Russian immigrant, they were all written between the very late fall of 2019 and uh, the late spring of uh, 2020. The initial impulse was this sense of uh, existential and political despair of this angst that I felt as an immigrant, as a humanist, as a Jew, um, as a writer, I suppose, uh, um, following the first uh, trial of uh, then President Trump, who, by the way, in the book, I refer to as the Trump, in a sense, because I see him as a kind of uh, larger than life chthonic force. So that was one. And the other is um, sort of then the rather lackluster performance of the Democratic presidential candidates. So the initial way for me to fathom this was to write political satire. But then in late February, early March, as uh, living life retreated uh, um, because uh, the COVID pandemic was setting in, I sort of uh, turned away from politics and started to write about the epidemiological crisis, which also took me back to my Soviet childhood and to various other directions. The poems became less satirical and more lyrical. So I'll read a few. I will begin, I suppose, fittingly from um, the poem called uh, The Senate Trial. This refers to the first uh, impeachment trial, uh, but in a sense, it, it may as well return, refer to the current one. The Senate Trial. I often think about the Trump victory blaring from his trunk, the Constitution's butcher, his loyal senators 
behave like lazy generals who hate to ponder their future. They'll probably get away this time, imposing elephantine, he stomps out his critics. In our history's own court, will he remain the tweeting sort, the brazen face of politics? And another political satire, which is called Dreaming of Mr. Yang. This refers to Andrew Yang. At the time, he was a presidential candidate, and now he's running for mayor of New York. Um, Dreaming of Mr. Yang. I had a dream that Mr. Yang has joined Chabad and grown pious. He davens with his whole gang and only dines at kosher places. He now argues that the Chinese descended from the tribe of Simeon across the desert and seven seas. They traveled all the way to Xi'an. He changed his name to Yan Kilman, an ardent Zionist, Israel's defender, and Bernie's ratings all went down. Who needs a socialist self-hater? I woke up and checked the news. Barry Weiss gave Yang a big thumbs up. He'll get the votes of many Jews as long as he defeats the Trump. That he did, but we'll see how well he does at the mayoral election. The next poem now turning to poems about the pandemics. The next poem is called Go Clamming and Recite Russian Poetry. Why Russian poetry? Because in a sense, writing these poems in English, I was also in dialogue with some of the Russian poets who were particularly important in my development. Uh, Go clamming and recite Russian poetry. And this is for my daughters, Mira and Tatiana. At low tide, I bring my daughters where the ocean meets the pond. We call this area three waters. Beyond it lies Nantucket Sound. We join a troop of local pickers digging the yellow sandbar. In our party colored slickers, we look like tourists though we are Bostonians. The virus, dreadful, has sent us running to the Cape. In Chatham, we've taken refuge. This dacha is our last escape. How long will last? God only knows. The clams lie buried in the mud. The sun is bright. The panic grows. God grant that we don't go mad. And a couple of footnotes, Chatham refers to Chatham on Cape Cod, where we have a place and where we escaped uh, and the sheltering place. And uh, also students of, and readers of Russian poetry probably heard an echo of Pushkin's famous poet, poem about uh, going mad or not going mad. Um, the next poem I'll read is uh, called A Post-Soviet Guide to Coronavirus-Induced Insomnia. Like so many of us, uh, I suffered from insomnia during uh, parts of the coronavirus crisis. And uh, I had various mnemonic and poetic devices of, I suppose, lulling myself to sleep. One of them was to think about the Soviet leaders and Russian leaders of the past. Lenin liked the Moonlight Sonata and Swiss pen knives. Stalin liked plays by Bulgakov and funerals of old Bolsheviks. Khrushchev liked horn on the cob and abstract painting. Brezhnev liked young nurses and boar hunting. Andropov liked chamber theater and lawn tennis. Chernyenka liked black holes and Siberian dumplings. Gorbachev liked failed empires and Louis Vuitton bags. Yeltsin liked any kind of vodka and brass bands. Putin liked pestilence and silence. The next poem, perhaps in a lighter mode, although there is a certain darkness behind it, you will see why. It's called evacuation. And uh, writing it, I was paying an homage to the famous uh, Soviet absurdist poet, Daniel Harms. Evacuation. If in my Soviet childhood I'd heard this episode, I'd think that in all likelihood, I'd think that in all likelihood, it was utterly absurd. A Russian immigrant put his kids and wife into the car. His plan was to escape COVID. 
His plan was to escape COVID by moving not too far. They quickly realized their hound stayed behind. They turned around, they turned around and went back to Brookline. They drove across the empty fields on a desolate highway, a runaway feels, a runaway feels the way they felt that day. Don't worry guys, the immigrant said, cheering up his family. The Cape is safe. The Cape is safe. At the dacha, we'll be free. State troopers stopped them at the bridge and asked them who they were. They felt on edge. They felt on edge, but tried not to demur. Then at the supermarket where they had shopped for many years, the cashier's stare, the cashier's stare confirmed their worst fears. Around the corner from their lane, a town cop pulled them over. What brings you down? What brings you down? He asked them with a glower. Our place is here, they replied. Our taxes fund your school. They really tried to be polite. They really tried to be polite, tried hard to keep their cool. That evening, as they walked their hound, a neighbor accosted them. You bring your Boston germs around. You bring your Boston germs around and spread them in our town. Our immigrant wanted to transplant his family to Cape Cod, but now he worries that his plan, but now he worries that his plan will do them little good. He sleeps all day. He guards all night his family and homestead. His rifle is loaded. All right, his rifle is loaded, but his heart, his heart is filled with dread. Not all the time, but uh, there were times when uh, my own heart was filled with dread. Um, and uh, let me read uh, a couple of more poems, and then perhaps I'll ask Tatiana to read a couple of more. Um, so this one is called Dacha Renovation. And it has to do with the fact that when you live in a country house for more than several weekends, you start thinking about improvements. And uh, this is what happened. Dacha Renovation. A local builder drove me around the seaside streets of South Chatham. Ahead of us, a fox traversed the road, red tail flashing like a comet. That house I built three years ago for Dr. B, a Boston surgeon. His nephew shot himself in the garage. They haven't visited the place since then. We turned to Forest Beach, a seagull circled above the turret with a copper weathercock. They are getting divorced, a custody battle. What can I say? My customers have bad luck. We slowly drove uphill. It started to rain. You see that house with a widow's walk? I built it for a family from Maine. Please stop the truck, I said. I'm walking back. And walk back, I did. But uh, we found another person to do the, re the renovations who has been having better luck. And uh, let me read uh, uh, two more poems for now. Um, one of them is, uh, one of them is uh, called Cholera in Crimea. And this has to do with uh, the year 1970 when my father, both a writer and a medical doctor and also an epidemiologist was dispatched to Yalta in Crimea to work at uh, what was then a outbreak of a cholera or epidemic. And uh, what I remember about it as a kid, uh, cholera in Crimea. I don't remember the epidemic, just the panic. August 1970, Sebastopol, the smell of rotting apricots, my mother's dainty tunic, which kuiv kabich, the cotton heap, the groundswell of fear, seeding lines at the ticket office, vacationers like wartime refuge, like wartime evacuees, the talk of spreading illness, words like orifice or dehydration hanging in the breeze. The hasty packing, my collection of stag beetles forgotten on the windowsill, our train arriving at Kursk station, empty bottles, my parents kissing on the platform, reunion. I didn't know another parting was near. My father, 
a doctor would be dispatched to Crimea. And uh, I'll end uh, with uh, a poem called Taking Stock of uh, the Past Five Months. This poem put me in conversation with uh, Edwin Arlington Robinson, a great American poet. And the epigraph is from his very famous poem, There's Nothing More to Say. Taking stock of the past five months. The world makes no sense over the pa past five months. It's lost its innocence. We've learned the art of distance. We've mastered wearing masks. The world makes no sense. We're living in a trance without its daily tasks. It's lost its innocence. What happened to the sense of life and simple tastes? The world makes no sense. What do we tell ourselves? That our world is nuts? It's lost its innocence. Will we regain our strength? Will we recover our wits? The world makes no sense. It's lost its innocence. I suppose not all of its innocence, but some of it. And I would like Tatiana to read two more poems that I particularly admire in her book. Uh, if uh, she would, could please do that, Tatiana. Um, maybe you could read Loneliness. Okay. I'm going to read a poem called Loneliness. Imagine the loneliness of a crab. It takes its anger out by pinching swimmer's feet. It hides under the rocks, scared and shocked, waiting to be caught. Do people remember that they hurt a lonely being after it's been captured, dried, and mounted on the wall like the head of a deer? Maybe you could read that's a silly example. I'm now going to read my Sicilian trumpet teacher. Each time he comes to our house to give me a trumpet lesson, he arrives in a large SUV and tells us his family hasn't visited in ages. He drinks an espresso, spreads pages of music on the stand, and instead of playing, he talks about Sicily, Mount Etna and the distance his grandfather's old village, olives and rosemary, the only place he feels at home. We are very happy to take some questions uh, or comments. We really thank you for being here with us. Uh, so please go ahead and jump in and uh, we may or may not have time for a couple of more poems for the encore, but uh, please go ahead. And Amanda, can we have you back with yes, us? Yes, yes. Um, so just to reiterate again, if you want to submit questions, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A portion for both Maxim and Tatiana or both of them. Um, and if you did not see Tatiana, you have a couple lovely compliments in the chat for your reading and your poetic voice. Um, so feel free to read those. Oh, those are very nice. They are. Is this your first event, Tatiana, that you've done with your poetry? Um, my second. Your second? Are you getting used to it? You're gonna be a pro like like your dad soon? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. But Tatiana, you know, when I was growing up, my father used to tell me that I'm third generation writer, that there was a writer in the generation of grandparents. And so I sometimes pester Tatiana by telling her she's fourth generation. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure whether it's good or bad, but uh, yes, that's how it is. So we have a question from Paul who says, hi, um, and has a question for Maxim. Do you compose poetry in Russian as well? That's a very, very good question. Thank you, Paul. In fact, I guess I failed to mention that uh, what is different about this collection is uh, this is the first uh, sort of deliberate body of verse that I have uh, composed, even though I've been living in this country for almost 35 years since my family and I emigrated here um, in the summer of 1987. Up until recently, I had mostly been living with a certain strange language divide. Much of my prose had been in English, although I do write and publish uh, fiction and nonfiction as both languages, but 
uh, my poetry used to be predominantly in Russian. And uh, what, uh, what I felt for the first time working on this book, it's almost like this turn of picked up and uh, um, I'm grateful in a sense. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you start thinking about the beneficence of catastrophes. Of course, I would never, I would never suggest that uh, it's a wonderful thing to live through a pandemic or through political calamities, but there's no question for me that they somehow pushed me to compose verse in English. So that's uh, the long and short of it. Yeah. I was curious about that with the, the language differences. Um, if you find it easier or harder to write poetry in each language and how they like translate from one to another. Yeah, well, it's a very, very interesting question uh, and a difficult one. <laughs> I think, I think it would be fair to suggest that writing poetry in English, I write it as someone without what we might call uh, the perfect pitch. People perform and sing without having perfect pitch. You can train your ear, but uh, in Russian, you know, I hear all the perfections and all the imperfections uh, without having to strain my ear. In English, I think I work very hard. But then again, you know, there's nothing wrong with working hard on formal elements of poetry. In a sense, uh, those are very exciting and challenging things. But they're in, for me personally, why is the difference? For Tatiana, of course, she lives and breathes English language poetry. This is her natural native element. So right? <laughs> we do have a question for Tatiana about what inspired you to write your collection of poems. Um, well, I started writing poetry at the age of seven, and there was a book contest at Stone Soup, the magazine, and I wanted to be in the contest, and so I had already written, written about 15 poems. This was in 2019, so in the summer, I wrote about 15 more, and I think that really, in that contest, and also since I'm uh, my father's writer, my grandfather's writer, I think that also inspired me to write. Yeah. Um, someone I, in the chat does commend Maxim for being an enabler of Tatiana's poetic self. I wish I could take credit for it. <laughs> uh, I actually think my father used to read a lot with Tatiana alone. Now he has a weekly lesson with both girls and they read now all of uh, Evgeny Onegin, Pushkin's Eugene Onegin in Russian and discuss it stanza by stanza. So I really feel that it's uh, a poetic apprenticeship, uh, um, you know. So thank you though, thank you. Um, Svetlana says, thank you both. Lovely and challenging to hear your reading and telling of anxieties deeply familiar to many of us. Yes, thank you. And then we have another question for Tatiana from Misha. What inspires your poems? Um, what inspires your poems? Probably, um, well, mostly like the things I see around me. And I think I've, I've traveled a lot around the world and that's showed me a lot. And it's open, I think it opened me to a new side of the world. And I also like, I've, thought about things more, I guess, in depth. That's inspired me. Do, do you and your dad share any like poetic mentors? Like, do you share favorite poets or do you, are you pretty much separate in, in the type, types of poetry that you read and consume and study? Well, um, one of my favorite poem, poets is Robert Frost. And I think my I think my father and I like join I think we agree that he's like a very good poet and I think he introduced Robert Frost to me and that I got a lot of inspiration from him. What is interesting is back when we were living in Moscow a photograph of Robert Frost used to hang in my father's den uh, among a few photographs of writers that he particularly admired. And uh, I grew up hearing 
about it. My father also wrote a short memoir about hearing Frost read in Russia when he traveled there, not long before his death. So somehow uh, in Frost, I find a lot of existential inspiration, but also such tremendous formal mastery. And uh, I think for Tatiana, it's been really great to read him closely. She also wrote an essay, which Stone Soup published about Frost, about actually, uh, which is based in Franconia, New Hampshire. Yeah. Right, where he had a house for many years, north of Boston. So we don't have any more pending questions if either of you wanted to read another. Oh, never mind. One just, one, <laughs> several just came in. <laughs> Well, I, we just want to say thank you because I yeah. think some people may feel uh, some people are uh, coming in, others are probably leaving. Just uh, we're not going to stop, but uh, we just want to say thank you for being with yeah. us. Yeah, so um, so very much. And for anyone who is coming in late or has to leave early, we do record these events and put them up on our YouTube channel, um, Belmont Books. So that is something that you can finish watching or catch up on whatever you missed. Um, so Alexa has a question. I'm assuming it's for Maxim, but where do you get your ideas, Maxim, for your books and your poetry? Well, with this particular book, it's really exactly how I described it. And also it's highly obnoxious to refer to one's work, <laughs> but I, a couple of months ago, uh, I actually sat down and wrote a little essay, which, was published in um, Los, the Los Angeles Review of Books, where I sort of tried to articulate how I wrote these poems. And really the initial push was the sense of political and existential angst. And then I really felt that politics was no longer affecting me as deeply as uh, the pandemic was. Uh, and uh, basically by the beginning of the summer of last year, I found myself with about 40 poems, which I kind of felt were connected in many ways. And I chose 36 out of them. And uh, was very lucky because a publisher here in Boston published them very quickly. Um, so in this case, I really understand how these poems came about. But in other cases, uh, you know, uh, it is, uh, for me at least, initially a certain impulse that is coached in sound, in a certain language paradox, uh, less so an idea. What happened to the poems that you did not select for the book? They're sort of kicking around. Uh, I just didn't think they were uh, as good uh, in some ways. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I just want to say, uh, as an immodest father, Tatiana has been writing some new poems, which uh, she hasn't submitted yet, but uh, I really, really like them. So perhaps uh, there is going to be a new book eventually. They are different, uh, perhaps a little bit less formally oriented and a bit more philosophically, right, Tatiana, would you say? Well, I think I was, it, uh, they're a lot affected by like the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, so. Do you want to read one poem? Which one? Yeah, that's nice. I'm going to read my grandfather's Russian typewriter. He wrote novels and poems on that old gray pony, but now it sits in our shoe closet next to a pair of old rain boots. One afternoon, I find it on the kitchen table, released from its case. Buttons dusty yet ink still wet. I insert a blank page and type awkwardly in Russian. Oh, that's really lovely. And uh, perhaps, uh, well, I'm not saying we'll end, but uh, I'll read one more poem, which has a, uh, which is titled La Chanson de Chien. And it's not because of pretentiousness, sort of the song of dogs, but because it has a, a, a kind of international component, because it came from a conversation 
that I was having in a local park with other dog owners who came from very different places, including a certain person who was French. And somehow I, I kept thinking that this is more of a chanson, more of a French song. And uh, it has to do with walking our family dog, our, our poodle Stella, la chanson de chien. Dogs in the park maintain the proper distance. They probably sense the owner's reluctance to come together and take an open stance against the power. The park is like, with masks on, the people's faces hide their contagion. Yet every walker in the park could be an agent of the mysterious virulent invasion. Some canine partners look quite attractive in their masks and gloves. Hence, the protective attire has become the new elective affinity, a fashion for the rested. The weeping willows clench their greening lancets. To them, of course, the human drama is senseless. With our dogs in our silly dresses, we look incredibly defenseless. Life in the park is growing distant, static. We stand apart and talk, an Irish medic, a Russian immigrant, a Parisian academic, another day of the pandemic. So that's, uh, that's the poem I'll end with, uh, but we're happy to take more questions if there are any. So we have another one from Marina who says, Maxim, do you share your poems with your American students? And if so, what is their impression? Thank you very much, both of you. Very interesting and practical for my English as well. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Well, not in any systematic or didactic fashion, certainly, but uh, especially now the environment is such that one can sort of, uh, uh, one can enter many chambers without being noticed. And so uh, I'm always happy for students to attend the readings, but if you're asking if I assign them, uh, I haven't started, but perhaps, uh, you know, there's, there's a, few, a commercial future in there, right? Uh, I have, however, taught some of my father's works, especially some of the fiction that uh, I have translated or co-translated uh, with my mother and other translators. And that is a particularly meaningful activity for me. Yeah. And by the way, Tatiana and I have tr co-translated some of my father's, her grandfather's poems, and they have been published in several magazines uh, from Russian into English, yeah. What is it like translating like your father's work? Do you feel like there's a connection when you're translating? I absolutely love doing it. It's one of my really most treasured favorite things. I don't know how Tatiana feels. I don't think we've ever spoken about it. Well, uh, we did it this summer, wasn't it? Or the fall? Yeah. I thought I thought it was very interesting because I, I did it when I was younger. Well, not for my grandfather's poem, but a different, was it? Martinov, yeah. Yeah. And I didn't really think about it a lot then, but when I did it this year, um, I thought about the poem this morning. It really brought, it showed me something new. And it's interesting yeah. when translating, because Tatiana, your English is your first language, right? Well, um, when I when I grew up, I spoke English and Russian, but now I speak mostly English. Well, basically, I speak mostly in Russian to the kids, but uh, of course, uh, being normal immigrant kids in a bilingual household, because my wife is American born, uh, of course, they speak to each other in English, and uh, English is the lingua franca of the household. Uh, so Russian is somewhere in Tatiana, no question about it, and she can read it and speak it, but uh, you know, it reminds me, years ago, actually, my father and I were in, in Tokyo, and we both spoke at Tokyo University. It was kind of uh, half a day of uh, a double seminar. And uh, um, I spoke about translingualism. And I basically said, look, the point is, of course, uh, that uh, as is often the case with immigrant writers, uh, right, we choose our language, but languages also choose us. Uh, it's different with children of immigrants who are born into, say, the English language, because for them it is uh, perhaps destiny, but it's not a choice, uh, right? Uh, so Tatiana's writing in English is uh, absolutely a natural, seamless kind of phenomenon, right? 
So Marina also asks if you translated anything from Pushkin. Not in any in any systematic fashion. Uh, um, here and there uh, in quoting, uh, but um, there is actually a Boston-based poet, Philippe Nkalaev, who is a very talented poet and translator who has been translating Pushkin into English, I think, very, very well. Uh, and uh, I also very much admire the early translations, not Nabokov's translation of Eugene Onegin, which is not strictly speaking formal, but his early translations of Pushkin like he did soon after coming to America in the 1940s, those are strictly formal and very accurate. And I think they're really, really, really marvelous. So that looks like all of the pending questions for right now. Um, but I wanted to thank you both for, for doing this. Um, what I, is I next? Just wanna, I just want to oh, say ahead. one thing, which is, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to commit a useful truism. I truly mean <laughs> that uh, it's very important for, for all of us to support local independent bookstores and particularly this wonderful bookstore that was started by a writer doctor in the Chekhovian tradition and the William Carlos Williams tradition. These are really bastions of culture and they will not cancel culture on us. And uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for having us. Of course. Um, can you both speak to what you're, what you're working on next? Hmm. What are we working on next? <laughs> um, well, I'm writing poetry just by the day, but maybe eventually I'll write, I'll put them together as a book or submit them to a magazine. Do you think you'd, you'd do any more dabbling in verse at all? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also started tentatively a new collection, which I'm thinking about as a kind of political afterlife. And uh, uh, there are about six of them together. They're different. There's something about them. I don't know why that reminds me of uh, a certain uh, Brechtian intonation. Uh, um, I also, just so you know, next week I have uh, a piece that has to do with skiing that is coming out in a New York-based magazine, which uh, I'm very much looking forward to because uh, I wrote it recently. And it has to do with sort of uh, a skiing adventure in Europe and a skiing accident, but also dreaming about skiing in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. So everyone should should be on the lookout in the next week or so. I hope so, yes. Well, thank you all for, for coming tonight. I've dropped uh, links in the chat uh, of where you can access both Maxim and Tatiana's books through our website. Um, a happy and kind of bittersweet problem to have. Maxim said that like a lot of uh, our warehouses are sold out of their books, but hopefully they'll be reprinting and restocking um, and we can keep you all updated if you order their books on, on how long it will be. We do ship around the US, so feel free to take advantage of that if you're, if you're not local. But thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, yes. thank you Amanda. Thank of you course. all. Good night. Good night.